Hi everybody, this video is specifically about your ethnography projects um, and uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the next steps you'll be taking in the coming weeks with this project. So I'm going to run through what I think of as sort of the four key steps for the project. You're in step one right now and I want to give you a sense of how to proceed through the next steps. Okay, so that's that is the purpose of this little video just to um, check in with you as you um, work on your projects, okay? So, as I said, I think of this in terms of four steps. Step one is data collection. That is the step that you are in right now. Um, everyone, um, just as a quick recap, everyone gave me a proposal. I gave you feedback on that, and you started um, interviewing people, observing things, that kind of stuff, right? That's what we mean by data collection. So during this period, which hopefully you're, you've done some of this and you're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. If you look at the syllabus, you see that I scheduled through the end of this week for data collection. If it goes a little beyond that, that's no problem at all. I know that you can't always um, control, for example, when you can schedule an interview. So it's okay if it goes a little beyond that, but it's mainly the idea is to stay more or less um, in the sequence, right, and moving it forward. So. During this period, you've been doing your interviews and observations, and in total, you're going to um, make sure that you do at least six interviews and at least six episodes of observation, okay? Now, um, uh, nearing the end of this week and starting next week, you're gonna move into um, starting to do something a little bit different with those materials that you collected. And that's going to be first the analysis of what you've collected and what you've found, and then writing that up. Okay, so those are the next two components of the project that I want to talk about. Okay, so let's talk about analysis. Um, and what I'm going to lead you through here is just a really simple, straightforward way to analyze any kind of material that you collect. The research projects you guys are working on are qualitative, okay? What that means is you're going to look at the materials that you collected as sort of little narratives or little stories, okay? Um, and the analysis process that I'm going to describe here is how to identify the key themes and issues that um, are emerging from this collection of stories that you are compiling right now, okay? All right, so... This also has some steps, um, and again, it's the reason to put it into to numbers or steps is just to try to make it straightforward and to give you a sense of um, moving from point to point, okay? So once you've collected your six interviews and six observations, that's the point at which I want you to begin this analysis, and here's how I suggest you do it. The first thing to do is to gather together all of the material you've collected. Uh, from your interviews and, obs and observations, that's going to mean that you have, for example, whatever notes that you have written down about what you observed, um, any notes or recordings or transcriptions of the interviews that you did, right? Some of you may have done some extra stuff, like done some quick surveys or something. If you did that, it's not required for the project, as you know, but if you did that, get that together too, okay? If you took a bunch of photographs in your um, field site, bring those two, right? Everything that you collect, you get it all together in one place. I understand that this will be, for the most part, electronic stuff, but that's fine, right? Just put it all in the same folder. Get all the stuff next to each other so you can think about it as a body of data, okay? What I'm trying to get you to think about here is to not think of, like, the interviews over there, the observations over here, but you're starting to think of all the material you collected as one thing, as one pool of information, okay? Now, once you have all that stuff together in the same, you know, electronic space or, or, or if it's written notes all in the same big pile on your desk, I want you to, in one sitting, basically, go through all that material. That is, read through all your notes, either listen to all the interviews or look at your notes from those interviews, go through all the information in one fell swoop, okay? While you're doing that, I want you to pay attention to anything across all that information that repeats, okay? It's very straightforward. You're just looking for stuff that happens more than once, okay? The things that could repeat, it could be particular words, right? Like if, um, 
in, you know, three out of your six interviews, people keep using the same words to describe their experience, um, that might be something that you'd note. If the same objects or the same music is playing every time you do an observation, then that would be something to notice, right? If when people tell you their story, they all include very similar kinds of experiences, that would be something to note. You're looking for patterns. That is what you're looking for. Um, and all a pattern is, is something that happens multiple times, right? So as you're looking or reading through and looking through all of your data, keep an eye out for things that repeat. Um, and what I want you to do is to create a list, okay? Just a working list of all those repeating items. You can just jot them down on a piece of paper. You can type them into a Word document. It doesn't really matter at this point, okay? Just a working list. Here's all the repeating things. Now, when you have that list of repeating items, I want you to look at the items on that list. And I want you to start to think about what might be the social significance of that repeating item. You're going to do this based on your experience doing your research, right? At this point, if you've done six interviews and six observations on a topic, you know quite a bit about it, right? You've heard a lot about it. You're starting to get a feel for it. And I want you to rely on that sense that you're starting to develop, okay? So in other words, it's okay to sort of go with your gut on this to some extent. Um, this kind of um, analysis of qualitative research materials, it relies on the interpretation of the researcher to a certain extent, right? You need to be able to back up what you're going to claim, but it's okay to start to feel that something is important because you have knowledge of the social world that you're investigating, okay? So look at the items, the repeating items from that list, um, and see if you can come up with some kind of meaning it might have. And it can be a provisional. Don't worry, we're going to work through the details of it in a little bit. Um, do you think that those repeating items say something about, for example, the identity of the people you're talking to, or about their status, uh, about their sense of power, or their sense of a lack of power? Does it tell you something about the history of a particular phenomenon, right? Um, these are just examples, but try to come up with some kind of social significance that might be relevant to those repeating items that you identify, okay? So once you've done that, these steps one, two, and three, what you've ended up with are a bunch of pairs. And when I say a bunch, it's not, you know, a hundred, right? Um, and it's a little hard to put a number on it, but I would think that when you go through your materials and find repeating items and then sort of pair them up with, with a social significance, um, I can't imagine you'd have more than something like, you know, five to ten, maybe? Um, some of you might have three, some of you might find twelve, right? But you're not going to have a hundred. And if you only find one, then keep looking, because there's probably more in there that you're, that you're skipping over, okay? So you've got this list of pairs. Right? Um, and what you're starting to do in, in crafting this list of pairs is um, you're starting to actually sketch out an outline of the body of your paper, of the main section of your paper, okay? Because those, um, those uh, ways of thinking about social significance will become analytical themes and the specific repeating items that you found in your data will be the evidence that backs those themes up, okay? So this list of pairs, um, hold on to those, and you're going to write the central part of your paper based on them, okay? Um, so we're, we're not quite there yet. We're not quite, quite to the writing. So start by taking that list of pairs and see if you can edit it down a bit, right? If you have 10 items on your list, that's that's kind of a lot for the paper. Um, and you might find when you look at that list of 10 that um, some seem more interesting, right, or more important, or they're just more robust, right? When I say robust, I mean, you know, when you looked to see where things were repeating. If, if there's something on there that repeated twice, and there's another thing that repeated 20 times, the thing that repeated 20 times is more robust, right? There's more there. There's more um, just weight of, mater of material attached to it, okay? So, um, so look at this list and see if you want to edit it down, right? What are the most important, most interesting, 
um, items on that list, and you want to prioritize those, okay? So as I said, these pairs will form the heart of the paper for the main section, the analysis section that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and your first step, once you get to this stage, which none of you are quite here yet, but when you get to this stage, um, the way you will start the writing process is to write up those pairs, right? So talk about what's the key social meaning or significance that you think is represented here, and what is the evidence from your data, meaning um, things people said in interviews, things you observed in your observations, that back those ideas up, okay? Okay, so this is really this very, I think, sort of basic analysis process that I want you all to, tr to try to use once you have the bulk of your interviews and observations done, okay? It's best to do all of your interviews and observations and then go through this process, right? Um, but on the other hand, I know that you might, you know, it, it, because it's sometimes hard to schedule things, maybe you'll do, you'll have everything done except for you just still trying to schedule that last interview and it's taking a little bit of time to get in touch with that person. It's okay to move forward on this process. And then when you do that final interview, you can feed that information back into what you've accomplished through the analysis, okay? Um, but what I would suggest is don't start trying to do the analysis like right at the beginning, right? If you've only done one interview and one observation, don't start trying to analyze it because you just don't have enough, right? Remember that what you're looking for here is patterns, themes, right? Um, if you only have one of something, it's hard to figure out whether there's a pattern. Something that only happened, something that happened in your first interview may never happen again, okay? So, um, so try to hold off on the analysis until you've completed all or the vast majority of your data collection activities and then do the analysis, okay? All right, so um, once you've sort of moved through that, right? So this is now a little bit into the future. So um, if you look at this at the syllabus, you'll see that where we are right now is I, in, in the, um, you know, for each week I've said, here's what you should be working on in the, ethnog in the ethnography project. So um, if you're following that roughly, then um, you're still doing data collection and starting next week, you'll move on to analysis and writing. So the first step will be analysis. You're not gonna move directly into writing, but because you will be transitioning into the tr writing process within this next couple of weeks, then I do also wanna spend a little bit of time in this video talking about the writing process, okay? Um, but again, don't jump from data collection to writing. What you want to write about is what emerges from your analysis. So follow the sequence. It will help your paper be a better paper, okay? All right. So let me start with just sort of the end point, what this piece of writing is going to look like, and then we can back up a little bit in how you're going to take it on, okay? Um, and this information that I'm going to give you now is um, also what's included in the hand handout about this project, okay? So this is not sort of brand new information. Um, so your final paper, when you turn it in at the very end, um, is going to be at least six pages long, not including the appendix, which I'll talk about what that is in a minute, right? So six pages of writing with then an appendix after all, or sorry, af after the end. Um, and um, you're going to organize your paper in a, um, a series of subsections. These aren't separate papers. You're, you're writing one paper. But I want you to divide your paper into these sections and each section should have a subheading so that the reader, um, as the reader moves through your paper, the reader knows sort of where he or she is at, right? I mean, I'm the reader, but I'm just saying in a more general sense, right? Like when you write a paper, you want your paper to be organized in a way that the people who read it can follow the logic of, of where they are, right? Like how you are moving from point to point and from section to section. So I have given you the sequence of sections that I want you to include, and you can either just title your subsections with these really basic titles, introduction, methodology, analysis, etc., or you can also make up other subheadings that also still indicate what that section is about, but might be a little bit more interesting, right? Okay. 
Um, and this is the basic sequencing that you'll find in any paper. So part of what we're working on here is how to organize a research paper, okay? So this is not just how to organize a research paper in cultural anthropology, but how to organize a research paper more generally, all right? So hopefully this will also help you in subsequent classes that you take where you need to write a research paper. All right, so let's talk about what those sections are. So the first thing, uh, uh, the first part of your paper is going to be an introduction, okay? And again, you can call it introduction or you can call it something else. And in the intro, what I want you to do is to provide a brief overview of what your paper is about. So that means describing the, the cultural world you study, your subject, right? And the most important thing you're going to do in that introduction is to include your thesis statement. The thesis statement is one sentence that says, here is the main thing I learned. Here is the main point I want to make in my paper, okay? Typically, it's the last sentence of the introduction, all right? Um, the intro will be brief. It probably will be half a page to a page long, right? Depending um, on your on your project, but it's not it's not meant to be a long part of it. Okay. Um, as an aside, I will also say that at the very top of this final paper, I want you to um, I want you to give your paper a title. All right. Um, you'd be surprised at how many fabulous papers I get from students that have no name. Right. This is your project. Give it a name. Okay, give it a title. You have a title at the top, then you're going to have the introduction. Okay, after the introduction comes a section called methodology. This will also be a fairly brief section, and it will be um, simply describing what kind of data collection you did. All right, now I know you all did more or less the same thing because I am the one who assigned you to do interviews and observations, etc. All right. But part of this is also just going through, um, going through the process of, of writing up what you did, okay? So you're going to say, you know, I conducted interviews, um, I observed X, Y, and Z kinds of activities. In my interviews, I talked about people who did the work or the relatives of the people or the friends of the people, whatever it is, right? Just a brief description so that I, as the reader, know, oh, okay, here's the techniques this person used to collect their data. Okay, so the intro and the methodology should be pretty straightforward, fairly short sections. The next section, the analysis section, is the main part of the paper. It'll be the longest section, and it'll be the section where all the most interesting stuff takes place. Okay, um, what you will do in the analysis is write up exactly what I was talking about when I talked about the analysis, right? Um, remember those pairings of uh, sort of key analytical points and the evidence that connects to them, right, from the things you found to repeat or to make patterns across your um, the data that you collected, that stuff, that is what goes in the analysis section, okay? So what I'm asking you to do for the analysis is to write up the most important or interesting themes that emerged during the project. And one way to think about that is, what patterns did you see when you looked at all the information you collected? And what do those patterns mean or signify? Okay, so you're always going to want in this analysis section to have um, some kind of social significance or meaning that you're um, describing. And you're always going to want to have specific evidence from your interviews and observations that back those meanings up, all right? So there's a sort of um, a more abstract part and a more concrete part in what you do in the analysis section. The fourth section after the analysis is the conclusion section. And the conclusion section should follow, uh, follow up on the thesis statement that you made in the introduction. Remember that I said that in the introduction, the most important piece is your thesis statement. That is the sentence in your intro where you say, here is the main thing that I learned. Here is the main thing I want to tell you, reader, right? In your conclusion, you want to return to that, right? So you want to follow up on what you claimed in the intro. So you want to say sort of what happened, right? How did what you said at the beginning in your thesis statement how did you carry that out throughout the rest of the paper, right? Um, another way to think about the conclusion is if you think about those themes and points that you make in the analysis section, how do those all tie together, right? Is there some sort of larger scale point, right? Something that ties it all up that you could point out, 
that's another thing you could put in the conclusion, okay? Um, so the conclusion is a return to the main point that you laid out in the introduction. One way to think about it, um, I often think about the introduction and the conclusion of a paper as acting sort of like bookends, right? Like two, um, two heavy things at either end that hold everything in the middle together and hold it up. Um, so you want the introduction, the conclusion to be sort of parallel sections of your paper, okay? Um, and then I am asking you to have another section at the end called the appendix. So the six pages of writing are, um, are sections one through five, okay? And then after the paper, right, an appendix is something that comes afterwards, um, you're going to have a list, okay? So it's not exactly part of the paper, but it's a key thing that I want you to include. So at the end of the paper in the appendix, so you're going to sort of like, you know, um, start a new page, right? Like return to a new page after after the end of your, your six pages. I want you to provide a list of your research activities, okay? So this is more like a reference page for me. So I wanna see what you did, all right? So uh, for each interview and observation, I want you to provide an entry on this list in the appendix, okay? And it can be really basic information. Who, where, when, for how long, what was the main subject? So you could say, um, interview one with person X on this day, right? So it'll be like that, a list. You can bullet it, you can number it, um, either one is fine. Um, bear in mind that for your interviews, um, you are welcome to use pseudonyms, that is made up names, or uh, some other kind of anonymous code in order to protect the privacy of the people you talk to. That's a very common practice in anthropology, that is using made up names. Um, so that people that you interviewed, right, know, can know that their their identity will not be revealed, all right? That's really something that you, as the researcher, should work out with your interviewees. If they don't care, right, and if there's nothing particularly sensitive about what they're telling you, then it might be fine just to use their names. But either way, it's always fine to use a, a false name, right? I don't need to know the identity of the people, I just need to know the context of, of what they told you, okay? Um, if you have any visual items, and again, this is not required, but some of you may, anything like that, feel free to add that to the appendix as well, right? For example, if you um, created a map of the, you know, the, the thing you were um, learning about, right? The, the space that something was happening in and you want to include that, that's another thing that can be um, placed in the appendix, okay? Um, so the appendix is the final section of the paper. All right, so um, th this is, a, again, just sort of an introduction. Actually, let me go back to this first slide. Um, so this is just an introduction to sort of the, the sequence that we're working through right now, okay? Um, so you're working on data collection, hopefully moving toward wrapping that up. Then you'll conduct... Um, the analysis, right, that I talked about, going through all the material, finding those um, patterns, trying to assign some significance to them. From there, you'll move into the writing, right? And one of the main things I'll suggest about the writing is that I gave you the sequence in which the subsections will appear in the final paper, but typically one doesn't write from starting with the intro and through to the conclusion. Typically, one starts writing in the middle of the paper and then writes the beginning and the end, okay? So it makes sense when you look at this slide right here, because basically once you do that analysis, then I suggest you first write up that section, the analysis section, right? That's the heart of the paper. That's where the main information lies. So if you write that up first, that will actually make it easier then to write an introduction and conclusion, right? Because the introduction and conclusion, remember, are the bookends. They are the framework that hold up the, um, the central part of the paper. So you'll have a better time knowing what to introduce, right, if you already know what's in the analysis section. So that's the sequence that I suggest. Your paper is going to still look like that sequence that I describe on the writing part, but, um, but you're going to write it sort of from the inside out, okay? The very final stage is revision and editing, um, and I'm not going to talk about that right now because I want you to get through these next couple of steps before we return to that. 
there's a week in the sort of final final week of the semester when you're going to be working a lot on finishing up these papers. And I'll talk more then about what the revision and editing might look like, right? Um, the one point I'll make right now about revision and editing is um, I want to strongly encourage you to not submit um, what is basically the first draft of your paper, okay? So in other words, once you get a complete paper written, it's not done, okay? That's your first draft, and that's a huge accomplishment to get to the first full version of the paper. But the best paper is one where you take that first full draft and you go back through it, and you revise it, and you edit it. And it doesn't mean you have to redo it, right? Sometimes those revisions might be fairly minor changes. But that final step of going back through it, tightening things up, fixing all the typos, changing any sentences that are awkward, clarifying your point, all of that stuff can make a huge difference on how well the final final paper will read. And, 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 and um, I think it's worth, therefore, making sure that you leave time to do that, okay? But don't worry about revision and editing, editing yet. Um, right now, focus on completing your data collection and then moving on to first analysis and then writing. Um, if you have any questions about anything that I've said here, please feel free to get in touch. Uh, I'm also happy to look at drafts if you um, if you pull something together or look at initial, you know, sort of analyses or whatever it is. At any of these points along the way, you're more than welcome to reach out to me or to come to my office hours, and we can talk about where you're at and how things are going. Um, but I'm hopeful that this video will give you a sense of what the next steps are. Um, and again, we will return to more conversations when we get a little bit farther along the process. So I hope you have a great rest of the week, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.